Yeah, this is a uh, fencing scoring machine that uh, belongs to my fencing club, the uh, Kansas City Fencing Center. You can see it's a uh, Favero Full Arm Zero One. Uh, of course, does uh, Epi Saber and uh, foil. Uh, the problem with this thing, let's look at the back of it, is that the connectors with the body cord plug into and the power, which is the two prong connector on the right. Uh, Someone probably tripped on a thing and pulled uh, one of the body core connectors loose and broke the connections. Uh, these things use 5.08 millimeter connectors, uh, terminal block connectors for position that can hold anywhere from 14 gauge up to uh, 30 gauge wire and then a two position one. So the uh, problem is that when the body cord pulled out that comes down between these two, it uh, ran that thing forward and broke one of the connections underneath. Uh, fortunately, I was able to bend this thing forward and uh, there's no damage to the circuit board. And I'll explain that in a second when you see the bottom side of this connector. The placement connector for the body cord is uh, obtained from DigiKey. It's part number 277-1265-ND. If you ever wonder what ND stands for, DigiKey stands for no discount. Got these connectors and uh, this is what saved the board from having the vias torn out is that the lead frames, lead frames right here are slightly bent, so when the uh, cord pulls on it, it's going to yank and bend the lead frame instead of pulling the via out. The problem is you can't just bend these things back because these lead frames, uh, they're copper plated, uh, excuse me, nickel plated copper, usually uh, have a finite uh, bend lifetime, usually about five cycles before they break, and that's what happened to connectors on the board is that one of the uh, pins uh, broke underneath. So that I'm going to go ahead and replace them right, rather than try to bend them back and risk breaking another one. I forget the uh, part number for the two terminal connector is uh, DigiKey 277-1263-ND. And yeah, machine to get the motherboard out, it's got four screws, uh, Phillips head one, two, three, and four. So we're going to pull those out. And the only thing I'm going to watch for is the uh, ribbon cable right here which connects onto a 100 mil header and you're going to want to lift that off so you don't break the thing when you uh, peel the board back. Now that the uh, board is out, you can see where the damage was done. Uh, that second, excuse me, the first pin from the left, you can see how it's cracked. I had uh, touched it back up with a solder and just verified the uh, continuity for all the connections, but I want to go ahead and replace this. So uh, I'm going get to a, get a pair of uh, uh, fine snippers here and cut those uh, leads off so we can remove the connector. I'm not going to try to desolder the thing as a whole because that's going to be tricky. You'd have to either use hot air or a bar type iron to try to heat all four leads at once to get the thing out. The connectors are out of there. You can see the traces. It looks real clean underneath there. Now the uh, tracers were torn and the solder fillets look good so uh, there wasn't a ton of force applied to the via that would have torn it out. Using a uh, solder and iron a pair of fine uh, good strong tweezers we're going to heat the uh, bottoms of those joints and yank them on through. We're going to yank from the top outwards so uh, the clip joints don't get caught into the via because they're a little bit expanded uh, when we try to pull them through. Inside we'll take and heat heat the other side and probably push through the tweezers just enough to get a good grip on that other side and then yank them out. The uh, leads have been pulled out of there but there's still solder in the vias so we're going to take and uh, the vias are plated through holes I guess you'd call it. Take some solder wick and hit it with the iron and get all that solder sucked out of there. Right now the, uh, uh, that the solder has been wicked off, I've got a, in my tweezers, I've got a, a wet piece of paper towel with uh, isopropyl alcohol, 99%. Uh, that's hard to find unless you get from a laboratory supply store. But what you can do is go down to uh, AutoZone and get some stuff called IsoHeat. It's in a red container, and that's for pouring in your gasoline during winter. Uh, it's isopropyl alcohol, 99% to mix with the water so your uh, uh, gas burns cleaner. So we're just going to take and rub that down to get some of the flux off and get a nice clean surface again underneath there. You can see the new connector, uh, the four pin connector, fits uh, nicely down into there. The uh, jaws for the wires are just a slight bit smaller but not that much smaller. You can see it's a little shorter too. So we're going to take and uh, solder that in from the back side and also install the one for the 12 volt supply. All right, those new connectors are soldered back in, so we'll take and, uh, again, using the alcohol, clean off the reflux on there. I should also mention that I'm at a uh, static uh, dissipative workbench right here, so I think most of the circuitry in this thing is TTL anyway, but uh, still it's good to observe uh, static precautions. All right, now that those uh, connections connectors are back on, I want to take and test this thing. 
If you look at the uh, diagram right here, you notice uh, it's got the A side and the B side. So these are the body cord attachments, the two close ones and the far one, and then the other one, the one for the other opponent, the two close ones and the far one, and the uh, piss connection. They've labeled these sides A and B. That's kind of confusing. What, what I've done right here is labeled this A, B, C, and C, B, A. And we go to the Wikipedia article, Wikipedia article on uh, fencing, and it will list the connections for EPE. And I'll show in a second on a piece of paper what those connections are. But here are the connections with the same nomenclature, A, B, C, and C, B, A. Uh, connected between A and B is the tip of the EPE, and the tip is insulated from the uh, blade and the guard of the weapon. So each opponent has their own tip connections, and then the uh, uh, connection C, what is sometimes called ground, I don't want to use that nomenclature, but that is connected to the uh, weapon itself. And remember, the tip is insulated. So when you get the 750 grams of pressure, that closes the two contacts on the tip. And when that happens, and the tip, either connection A or B, is not touching the opponent's weapon, the guard, then it will signal the green light. Likewise, for the opponent over here, when their tip closes and the A or the B connection is not touching this opponent's guard, then it will light the red light. However, if the tip closes, which means connection A or B is touching opponent C right here, touching their weapon, then it will not register the green light and there is a yellow light that will uh, turn on. And that's the check that you do it before you start your match. And likewise, the same over here. Now the piss connection, that's similar. So uh, if these two contacts touch A and the B, if that closes and it's touching the pissed, then you're also going to not register the score. So I want to take and uh, go through and test these connections to make sure that everything's working before we button it back up. All right, I've taken and uh, labeled the tops of these connectors, ABC, the pissed, and CBA, so the, uh, the uh, green opponent and the red opponent. And I've connected this thing to 12 volts DC. It's interesting, they don't run off of 12 volts DC or AC. So what we're going to do is put wires between the terminals right here and check the lights that make sure they turn on. And you notice that there's the uh, green scoring indicator right here and the uh, light that tells whether it's touching the opponent's blade or the pist. And we've got the same thing over here for the red and then the indicator that, that if it's touching the pist or the opponent's blade. Start out by touching the A and the B circuit together on the green opponent. You want to make sure that you touch the uh, top of the jaws or else it won't make uh, electrical continuity. Now that's touched, you'll see the opponent's light, the, uh, light turns on, indicating the touch. Do the same thing for the AB tip connection on the red opponent. That turns on. That's the lockout functionality. Uh, we're going to take and uh, uh, permanently connect the uh, tip B connection of the green opponent over to the uh, blade slash weapon connection of the red opponent. And we're going to take and uh, simulate a tip closer by connecting the A and B. Take and uh, close that AB connection, you're going to see the yellow light turn on and the uh, scoring is locked out. Repeat that test, but this time we're going to take the green opponent's A uh, connection and, and connect it to the uh, uh, blade connection for the red opponent. And take and again close that AB connection, the yellow light will turn on or should turn on if it's uh, functioning correctly. We're going to take and uh, connect the, uh, the green opponent's uh, A connection, the tip, to the pist. The yellow light is turned on constantly now. And this, you want to follow up and also connect the B connection to the pist and verify the yellow light is on again. Then you're going to take and repeat that for the other side. You'll take and connect the uh, either the A or the B, both of them, to the opponent's C connection and then short A and B together and make sure that the lockout function occurs and the red side doesn't turn on. And then connect A or B to the pist and make sure that the uh, yellow light turns on again and then you're done and we can uh, wrap this thing back up. Back together now and fully functional. The interesting thing is look at the circuitry. There's only about seven discrete logic chips in here, uh, five resistor packs, uh, probably about 10 transistors, some uh, through uh, hole resistors, a crystal right here and a microcontroller. 
and a filter caps to the power supply and whatnot, a couple of external connections. And then in the front, of course, you've got these LED arrays, but the whole thing sells for about $450 new. That's the current price. I just looked it up. So they are definitely worth repairing. Uh, and again, they're, they, they're built very sturdily. It's got a 62,000s board on the thing. So uh, this looks like it's uh, double-sided. So built very sturdily. The most that can probably go wrong is uh, tearing these connectors up. Unfortunately, they're very easy to replace. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting.